Okay, focus, yes. So, Q&A. Joining us now is Johnny von Wilson, the director of the Battle of Africa. So I'm going to do a test now because usually I have just one channel and I usually have the uh, Sennheiser 416 as a microphone. This little baby up here. But now, and this is a test without telling you which channel it's which. So I have my lab here. So I'm gonna see which one sounds the best because this is like a spacious studio So even though I have my sound blankets and all that set up It always has this hollow tone to it if you know it bounces around somewhere So I think or my theory is that the lab would be you know less uh, of that because it's closer and you know It's lower so it doesn't pick up as much my guess uh, so let me know uh, which is the best sounding channel channel one or channel two so if you have headphones you can probably uh, test that out otherwise i'm going to choose the best one for the like the one that i upload but it's uh, fun to know which channel i should choose to cho to do the whole live stream with so just let me know and i will select that one for the next q a uh, so, channel one or channel two, which one's your favorite? And since there's no processing put on this one, uh, who knows which one you're gonna pick and who knows which is which? You should be able to hear it if you have some, you know, uh, experience. And internet seems good. Yeah, it should be good. I mean, I am going to switch, I think, the, uh, the operator. But for now I have this shitty in the city type of operator and it doesn't really work that well. But I have five of five, so it should you know, be good enough. But I think the other one that is more of a countryside operator would be even better. Which I should have for my phone, but I just switched. So uh, iPhone 10, loving it so far. If you know, anybody would ask, that's what I would say. So I got a question here uh, from Diego. Uh, Alvarado and this is from last week but I thought I should answer this one so hi excuse my English it's not my native language I quit my job one year ago to dedicate my time 100% to filmmaking but I think I need to practice uh, without make someone else lose their time do you think vlogging is a good exercise thank you I think that um, if you want work, if you want to work for clients and that sort of thing, then I don't think blogging is such a good exercise because it takes a lot of time and uh, all the energy that you put into it, it will make you like make a lot of stuff as long as you're on a, like a strict schedule, doing it like once a week or five times a week or every day, bro. Uh, so if you do that, then uh, you know, that's one thing that will, of course, get your skills up. But because it's such a stressful situation where you just like, you push things out and you push things out and you don't stop and like reflect and evaluate and all that, uh, then uh, that whole thing, process wise and all, that can make you, you know, not develop as fast as if you would do a proper production. So I would think that if you can, Biggest thing is consistency. So if you can produce stuff on a consistent basis, it could be once a month or it could be like once a week, but to make short films would advance, you know, your storytelling skills and your capability of like all the technical stuff and all that much more than uh, for instance, doing vlogging because vlogging is, it's so far from what you're ever going to do with a client that I don't think it's the best way to do it. And things will change, people will want to have like vlogging type of style and all that. But then, you know, it's going to be the vloggers that do that, that are established and famous. Most of the time, I don't think that, like we had a pitch, for instance, for, who was it? It was, a, yeah, maybe I can't say, but it was a big, big airline, big international airline. And we had a vlogging ID for them, which they chose not to do. They wanted to go with a different one. Uh, that was uh, more of like a traditional way 
of telling stuff. And I just think that like the market isn't really ready for vlogging yet. Even though you see vlogging all the time, we do on YouTube. I don't really think that like the market is there yet. Yeah. And the vloggers that do get the job, they get it because they ha are an influencer. That's the main reason for brands wanting to work with them. It is not the style. I don't think so at all. I think that anybody that has a more uh, advanced storytelling skill will always trump any vlogging style. But because there is so much value in the influence itself, then you know you you will kind of lose out because of that. So yeah, that's my thought. So let me see. There was a question here. Uh, let's see. What do you say? Joy, just an ordinary YouTuber. Let me just read through. I just need to pick the one because there are many posts. Uh, okay, so I'm 17 and I want to be a filmmaker. Should I try making a short film uh, or should I just go to film school? Uh, I've made some videos, but not uh, at the level that you're at. Uh, yeah, I think in general, kind of depends on how ambitious and how self-sufficient you are in terms of getting things done. If you are the person that will go out and make films and make films and make films on a uh, consistent basis, then I see no problem in going out and making short films. But you probably need a, like a day job and then do it on the side. But I think that the best thing would be if you get like an assistant job or a day job for uh, for instance, a rental house or something that is connected to film or, you know, an assistant at a production company, something like that. Because then at least you get, you know, the networking starts to build, you start to learn from others that are more experienced than you, and then you go out and you make your stuff always. Like start a YouTube channel, start uploading, start make things, build an audience. All those things uh, are uh, much better than going to film school. But if you aren't the person that will go out and do all these things and you know, make your career pop, then you should go to film school because there you can network and there you can kind of you know, be a bit more <laughs> lazy and laid back and let things happen and unfold for themselves. But I think that attitude is just stupid. So I think that you should never have that attitude. You always should have an attitude that you have to you know, create yourself or your success. Otherwise, uh, you know, things doesn't happen. That's the biggest mistake to like all the creative fields in the world. People that aren't successful, they're not successful most of the time, all the time I would almost argue, because they didn't try hard enough and because they weren't, you know, trying long enough. Because everybody that is successful, they've tried this so many times from so many angles and failed, 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 and then, you know, they make something work and takes like 10 years or something. So people need to have a little patience. And that's kind of hard to, to have if you're 17 starting out. Uh, but I think that the, on the good side, like being 17 starting out, you are naive and you think that anything is possible. And that should probably make for a good setting to make a film and be naive and make that happen without, you know, reflecting so much on the rejection, for instance, because that's what most people are afraid of, I think, that are a little bit more established. They're not going to kind of risk their day job to go out and make a film. And the people that do, the people that start a YouTube channel for, you know, like, do it for many years and are successful, they get the payback also. The people that are just, like, waiting for things to happen, they don't get anything. So you kind of need to just do things yeah. and you need to kind of focus on just making things and telling stories that are personal, I think. Um, but then it's also, it comes down to like you surviving. So you should probably get a job on the side or you go to school and you do the building of a YouTube channel while you're in film school. That's also a choice. Like check out uh, Justin Escalona, for instance. He goes to USC in the US. He does his YouTube channel. It's really successful. Um, I know he just started working with like Apple on something that he isn't saying much about. But I, I like what he does. And I think that that's set up with you being in film school and then doing your own channel thing on the side. That's a really good way to build, you know, uh, momentum and everything. Um, 
Yeah, okay. Uh, Carlito. Hey Johnny, any advice on making a doc about something that happened to me? I'm struggling with thinking as a filmmaker while at the same time being the subject. I'm an amateur, uh, so I've never done this before. Did you say documentary? Yep. Um, it would be good to hear like more of like a type of synopsis or short synopsis, like one sentence, what is the film about? Because that's much easier to, to give advice on. But I think in general, if we speak about like making a film about yourself, you have to kind of film and do everything uncensored. Like if you cry, you need to film yourself crying. If you uh, are sad, like all those things, you need to document them and you need to talk about things and you need to kind of do it in a way that is totally objective and uncensored. And then you can in the edit see where you want to put the line of how much you want to show yourself. But it's a good thing to have other people edit it if it's you and you feel uncomfortable with it. Uh, I think. In general, the more personal a story is, the stronger it's going to be and the more unique it's going to be because nobody else can tell the same story. So I think anybody that dares to do something that's personal, it's going to trump and be more unique. Uh, you know, any other thing that is told from an outsider perspective or from like a traditional storytelling perspective, it takes so much personality and uniqueness to make somebody care about the story. So to just do something that's kind of, you know, just telling a story according to all the, uh, the rules that are out there for telling stories, that's not going to be as good as if you can tell a personal story. I just think that like today, people are so used to the whole narrative structures of like the three act narratives that people are bored by that. I think that it's predictable. And if you can tell a story that's personal and you can kind of, you can form it in a way that, you know, if you're a filmmaker, it shouldn't, you should not be the one making it just illogical and, and uh, on a level where nobody cares. So if you are a filmmaker and you can make somebody care about somebody else it shouldn't be so hard to do it on yourself but you have to stay away from like censoring yourself thinking too much about how you look that's the worst thing with working with artists for instance if you do music videos i had a question about music videos yeah let's get to that uh, anyway they are so they know so much about like their own image and they have such a uh, image of what that should be uh, they have everything so thought out and, and calculated and that when you do that when you calculate everything and you don't leave room for like things that is just uh, you know stuff that is organic and weird and, and all those things when you put things too much to the perfection type of it could be narratives it could be like a, an image anything it starts to look overproduced and boring. Like everything looks generic in the end. And I think that's the thing with artists, that most artists are so afraid of showing any personality and being unique and being like, like showing anything else than their vision of themselves or whatever. And that is like the worst thing uh, I feel if you want to build an audience, if you want to build a connection to somebody, then that's just like, oh who will care about you if you don't make it personal and make it about other stuff than just your music. I just don't think that's enough. And it's the same if you're a filmmaker. You need to make it about like the real stuff is what the story should be about. Yeah, okay. There's a problem with the audio. What's the problem then? It sound is it let me know what the problem is with the audio. Um, it seems like it's okay if I look there. It seems okay, but let me know. It seems like it's maybe it's speaking sometimes when I'm looking down. Uh, yeah, so let me know. Oh, actually, maybe it is a little bit loud now again. On and off and on and off. Okay. There is a lag. What the fuck? Not in sync, okay.
still lagging. God damn it. Better, on point. Okay, so uh, I need to shut everything off, obviously. Yeah. So, lenses. I had this question about like micro four thirds lenses, but this one was about the 25 millimeter from White Lander. I don't have that one. I would like it though. But I have these from White Lander. This is a 40. These are EF. I have this one, which is 28, and I have a 20. These are small that I use for the C300. They can be really good for the compactness. Mainly I use the 28, I think. Um, so check those out if you want to have uh, Micro Four Thirds, or EF, uh, if you want to have Micro Four Thirds. This is probably one of my favorite, uh, tiny, but still really good SLR Magic 12 millimeter. But since you're looking for something that is, uh, you know, more of 25 millimeter, uh, 20 millimeter from Panasonic, I like this one. You cannot focus, you know, on this one manually, that's an issue. But it's 1.7. I like that. I like the 15 millimeter. This is probably an Olympus one, but this is DJI that's made this one. I think this is Olympus that makes these. I don't know, but this is 1.7 as well. Yeah. I like the compact factor. I don't like big lenses on the GH5. So um, yeah, I just, I just think that's uh, the way that I kind of prefer it. There is a zebra. Yeah, there is a zebra. I'm wondering with the zebra pattern, it streams it. So I should probably go in on the menu and shut it off. And then you have this one. Uh, anyway, uh, SLR Magic 10 millimeter, also a really good lens, but this is a little bit bigger. So amazing lens, but the SLR Magic ones I can recommend. They also have 25, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll, scroll, scroll. And also, to anybody that uses Zooms, I actually have a Zoom on now, so I shouldn't be saying this, but in general, I prefer Primes all the time. So if you are a Zoom person, you should start to limit yourself to Primes, just for the challenge. It's a good thing. Uh, okay, so where are we? What's the best junior job for a person who wants to become a filmmaker but doesn't have a film degree? Uh, Carolina Kubski. That kind of depends on what you want to do. But if you, for instance, want to be in uh, the visual department, for instance. So if you want to be a DOP, then the best thing is probably to be a gaffer or gaffer assistant, that sort of role where you can be close to the lights and close to the camera and be part of kind of painting the picture up. Uh, otherwise, if you want to do, for instance, uh, the costume design or the styling or that sort of thing, then an assistant to those people is much better. For instance, the scenography and all that, that's a, an amazing like hands-on type of uh, experience that you get from being an assistant. And I think gaffer, uh, gaffer is also that type where you have to carry things and you have to kind of put lights up and you learn stuff really quickly. Um, if you are assisting a DOP, for instance, I think that's uh, it's a slower process. I think it's better to probably go the gaffer way and then to assisting somebody that's uh, behind the camera. Because I just think that's so much more of the boring stuff, like copying material or like focusing things. It, it's not as much you learning how to handle light. And if you want to be a director, then it's much better to do the first AD, first assistant director, or assisting somebody close to them. First assistant director is more of like a organizational type of role. So that type of role really is a lot about sticking to time, <laughs> getting people to do things and doing it in a good way. And we always want that on our uh, productions. That's a really important part of any production. Uh, 
they can make you know production go so much smoother if they're good at their job and that person usually works really close to the director so you get um, yeah you learn a lot from that but I also think that being a DP is also a really good uh, way to learn how to make films if you want to direct it takes a little bit longer but knowing that uh, like handling a camera and knowing how to frame things and and all those things before you start to direct is a better way of doing it I think uh, but most people don't but I think that you learn much more of uh, the language of film by being that uh, yeah that's probably what I would say producing it's just being an assistant to that but I would say being that at a big production you are just gonna you know make coffee so try to make you know smaller productions and also go the TV route like uh, being on TV, uh, working on TV, you get so much more hands-on experience. So if you go like assist and log footage, if you want to be an editor, or uh, if you want to produce stuff, doing that on TV is easier to get responsibilities than on other productions. Okay. Groovex, hi Johnny, following you since quite some time. How long do you take for you uh, for a YouTube post such as the recent one, photography making, you a uh, better filmmaker, concept filming, editing, uh, Mark? Um, let me think. I think that photography, that was probably one that was a little bit more work than other stuff. Like for instance, the one that it's going to be this week about uh, cinematic light. I wonder what that took. Maybe that probably took like an hour to shoot. And then, uh, you know, we use a lot of archive materials, so some time to look for that and then for just that episode. And then um, we had st or we are using stuff from an old commercial. So to show breakdown like cinematic light. Uh, so then there's not that much to shoot so that might take an hour uh, and then to edit oh my I don't know like usually I don't edit anymore like I edit some of the stuff but usually I uh, give it off to Jonathan who you're actually gonna be meeting uh, on one of the behind the scenes things that we're doing with the confused African in a couple of weeks um, so for that I do uh, the last finishing touches on the the uh, everything but we've worked out so much of like a template of how we want to do things so I edited everything before and then now he edits a lot so I'm not sure how long he puts in to the edit and then I've made a lot of the grades I've made into power grades so he also does like a pre grading and pre sound mixing before I get it and then I put my final touches on that and edit so it's kind of a uh, like a collaborative process by now but um, I mean what can it take like two days or yeah probably two days or one and a half day post-production something like that but for that film for the one about photography it was more work that was probably like maybe a day of shooting yeah Let's see, where are we? I reversed one lens and taped it on to top of another lens, some crazy macro and it is uh, what to look at <laughs> for, for macro or what do you mean? Uh, I don't know, um, ants, if you have them, if they're not sleeping, uh, try some. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure what you want. Do you want... Uh, I would say avoid flowers because there's so much. Um, and then... Let's see, what's the next one? Uh, oh, right. So, Pearl of Africa. Mm, great. Now there's just a zebra pattern. Yes, there is. We'll probably try to remove it some other time. Johnny, good morning. Uh, I noticed that I can 
create a playlist on my channel called Creator North, but and put all videos there. Now this is to my benefit uh, or yours. I can do. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's good. Like playlist is always good for uh, boosting a channel. So for instance, the way YouTube works, but this changes all the time, is that it sees a new playlist and a new uh, like video on a playlist as a new update or upload. So that's a good thing in terms of like massaging the algorithm your way. Uh, so it should be a good thing. Uh, I'm looking at getting a C-mount zoom to adapt MFT. They are cheap and uh, have all the range you need. Yeah, C-mount I haven't used for a while, but uh, I did uh, a while back. Never sleep. Did you have a mentor when you were starting out? Someone you learned from and helped you to grow? No, but I usually, like, I didn't want to direct from the beginning. So because I was a DP, I got to learn from working with other people. So I was always interested in directing. I was always interested in making films. So if you don't have a mentor, uh, I think a good way of kind of getting that anyways can actually be to, um, to kind of work close to the production company. So I had a role of being both the DP and the editor on a lot of TV stuff that we did. And that makes you kind of the, the core of the story development and everything. Because you have to kind of shape everything when you do the visual part on location and then you have to shape everything in the edit. So I got so much experience of trying to put the stuff together and trying to make the story work from you know having shot everything. But I never wrote the script and I never directed any of the TV stuff that I did. So I was always left to like working with other people. So in TV you don't have a director a lot of the time. You have a, uh, what's it called in English? I don't even know. But it's it's like a producer that is uh, on location. Maybe somebody knows what, what they're called. Um, so for instance, we did a lot of documentary style of reality, which was not the uh, crappy, according to me at least, reality that most people are. Uh, kind of putting their money into and making but it was pretty close to being a documentary but everything was very directed so there was like okay so uh, say this was the direction for people a lot of the time uh, could you say this and I just think that's a you know that's not really a documentary but anyway that part of that process of making stuff really taught me how to be efficient with what I did. So I, even though I had like ethics and, and a thought of what documentary is uh, that I stay true to, but I'm the one drawing the line. So like anybody can have a different opinion on, on where that is. But I just learned a lot of efficiency in terms of telling a story and, and kind of uh, learning how to direct by being close to the director and being close to the producer and the script writer just because I was you know editing and DPing and that was a really good way to learn how to uh, make films and tell stories and become a better storyteller uh, and at the beginning I didn't edit anything it was just like a random thing where I got offered to edit a commercial for Absolute Vodka, which is kind of weird how you just get like this big international brand and then, you know, you get to edit their, their commercial. Uh, but yeah, I did that. And then from that, I felt like this isn't so hard. If I can do it for them, I can do it for anybody, I guess. And then I started to edit as uh, I was doing my DPing. And then I made my first film, Zero Silence. And that whole thing, uh, like making your film and having uh, been part of the editing process, that made it more uh, legitimate, I think, for me to kind of jump on uh, TV projects and starting to edit that. Uh, but I think the whole process of being close to also the production, like learning how people produce, working on TV productions and learning how like producers their work and all those things is so good for you if you want to either produce or if you want to direct a lot of the people that i take in uh, you know on our productions in terms of like um, people that are uh, working on some you know f gaffer or uh, 
uh, first AD or whoever it is. They have very like limited knowledge of what goes around before a production starts. And in a, for instance, commercial advertising setting, there is so much production going on with everything, especially when you get up in budgets in terms of like doing uh, pre-production meetings, uh, writing pitches, writing uh, treatments, all those things. And that whole process of being part of the process of doing TV early on, that taught me a lot of that structuring and, and how much planning goes into any production and like the script writing, even though we did like docu-reality type of stuff, there was a script for everything. I don't write scripts in that way, but I really take like that whole preparation aspect of it into what I do. And I think if you wanna be like efficient and, and learn from other people, try to get into those production companies that will let you be a part of that process. That's gonna teach you so much just by kind of being either in the production side of it or if you can assist the editor or whatever it is, depending on where you start out. If you are an editor, then go work with TV to learn that thing because I think that everything I learned in terms of doing docu-reality type of narratives that makes it so much easier for me to be efficient with advertising stuff. And that's what you have to be there if you want to make the most out of the budgets. Okay, scrolling up. And I don't know, maybe mentorship is good, but I've never had it. I've probably tried getting it, but you know, nobody <laughs> wanted to be a mentor. I actually think that this, if you can get this, it's probably more hands-on than a mentor. But what a mentor can do and what an executive producer, for instance, can do is connect you to people and open doors. And for that, it's really good. Uh, is it possible to, for you to do a live Q&A with you and your brother uh, to throw questions at both of you? Yeah, we definitely should do that. I think that we're probably going to do that now we haven't talked about it yet, but I think that it would be wise to do it as we get closer to the like the tutorial episodes on the Confused African. This is probably a couple of weeks away, but the, the tutorial episodes that are on distribution and marketing, where Andre has been like working uh, mainly on on trying to get it in, like scene, PR, all those things. It would make uh, sense to do it there, and I don't know. Uh, how if it's like one or if it's more than one session but that makes sense to do it um, yeah and I think that he, he can take different perspectives I think but I think when you've seen the behind the scenes episodes and everything probably makes sense to do it then because then we can also talk about like what's next and yeah all those things um, Patrick Levar do you pre-write your voiceovers or montages or do you just write up after you have uh, the video? It depends. Sometimes I write a voiceover and then I just throw it away and, and make something just, you know, spontaneous. Uh, so it, it really depends. Uh, sometimes I've pre-written a voiceover and I just record that months before I even shoot anything. Sometimes I just record it afterwards just to make sense of things. So it kind of depends. It's a really good tool to use if you want to be like efficient with the storytelling. I would think that like, as much as you can avoid having like the voiceover stuff, I think that is a good thing. But I think on YouTube, it's, it's actually a, a good thing because people are so like the attention span is so low so people want something to happen and make sense really fast so there i think it works better than for instance in a cinema but pearl of africa also have a voiceover but it's cleo that is the main protagonist that is doing the voiceover so it's personal and it makes sense because it's it's her um uh, uh, pete thumbs up uh, okay, so I would like to see a video about cheap gear for us beginners, as you know right now, don't have the budget, I mean camera, audio, uh, PC and stuff. What, what is a low budget? Let's do a poll. Well, maybe we can do a poll afterwards actually. What budget range do you want us to kind of come up with a video on that is low budget? Uh, 
if Andre is watching this, he should do this in the YouTube community tab. We'll see if he watches. I'm going to ask him. Let's see. Um, Green Vision Entertainment. I'm traveling around the world and film in every country, landscapes, culture, etc. Uh, it's wrong to not have a story. For me, it's hard to find a story for travel films. I just think that like travel films become the same and it becomes boring and, and all that really quickly. You either have to have like a conceptual thought of it, which I don't think travel film people do. They just make stuff that looks a little bit cool and a little bit slow motion and cut, cut, cut to music. That gets so much... Uh, uh, it's so repetitive. <laughs> I, I get so bored about it. And of course, if the aim is for you to just show how pretty a place is, then fine, that's enough, I guess. But if you want to like, create emotions and make people care about anything, then that's a really bad way of doing it. It does not make you as an audience connect with something. You have to be more personal and tell a story. And I think that if you meet people, just make it about stories, like talk to people. Um, I think that whole thing with like travel films and all that, it's just the same type of shit that commercial is. Like it's exactly the same thing, but it is on YouTube that people make. It's just like music videos. It makes no sense to me why people would want to make music videos if it isn't something that is like something that is new and you know a thought behind it. But with that said, for instance, uh, how do you pronounce it? Kwana Tskatsi, Katsi. Uh, that film is all like B-roll type of stuff. Uh, that is shot around the world and is just cut together. But then there is a conceptual thought about it. Like how will this show uh, uh, how the world is? And there's like a deep uh, understanding of this whole uh, storytelling that is about a certain thing. And then you need to go more, much more down to like the microscopic things in, in life. So for instance, if you make one, there's like a Swedish film that is really good. Uh, don't remember what it's called. Um, is it called Johan Söderberg? Maybe. Let me see. Johan Söderberg. Yeah, editor. Really good editor. I don't know if he's done much nowadays. So he made a film, Lucky People Center International. Fucking amazing. So good. Go see it if you can. Uh, that's, oh, he's from Bolnes. That's actually the kind of same, it's, if you make a film like that, that one is about dance, for instance, and it's centered around like the dance and the emotions around dance. There is a theme that kind of strengthens the whole visual vibe that people are going for. But if you just go to a spot and then you show that spot and you put some moody music, that's not gonna get any deep emotions from from nobody like people that are coming from there maybe they will feel inspired or maybe people will want to go travel but it's not going to affect anybody on a deeper level so if that's your aim then you should try to develop it into something more than that but if it's conceptual around for instance dance or sound or whatever you can do that and just focus on that and still just make it you know not so uh, voice driven or character driven you can do that but you have to kind of hone in on what the story is somehow. Uh, yeah. Um, Fabio. Is that the one? Yeah. Uh, where do you get inspiration for a film? Any book recommendation? Uh, I actually read two books the other day. Contagious good about virality and all that and another one is let me just check my audible growth hacker marketing both of them were good but inspiration for a film I kind of like go on intuition I look at like okay so what am I interested in it can be anything really but I usually try to look at like okay so what's actually 
I have a different like analysis and parameters that I look at. So there's one like what am I interested in? And then I look at, for instance, what do I think will be something that's going to be talked about in the future? What's going to be something that has not been done in the future? Where are, for instance, uh, stories lacking? Or where is, is there an angle to some type of issue in the world that is you know, underdeveloped or that is like trying to approach a problem or something from the same angle and nobody is trying to look at at things from this side or something like that that's one thing like trying to make it relevant that's super important and for anybody that's an artist and that is like this introvert or artist they probably hate hearing that that it has to do with those things as well but it does if you want to make money if you want to survive if you want to make a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth film it fucking makes the whole thing work you need to think about those things and another thing that usually like dictates what I want to do is like, okay, so what money do I have to make this? And how would I go about doing it like in a practical way? So you have to kind of be realistic. If you can just go with your, like I did with my first film, 5D Mark II and a lab and that is all you have, then you do that and you go and make it in that way. That limitation is the film that you're gonna make. And then you need to think about the ideas in that way. But I usually do a lot of research around the topics uh, that might interest me. And I watch a lot of films, I watch a lot of uh, articles that are written on the subject. I stay open to like random things just you know, coming by in social media and that sort of thing. And then I pick up on things and I kind of just go down the whole web of yeah, different inspiration. It can be anything, but usually I try to read like articles on a subject, Google around, try to find different uh, ways of looking at things and trying to figure out like a character or what character could be um, portraying this idea that I have. But the inspiration is such a, like it's such a fake thing in my opinion. Like it's just a matter of working and researching and doing hard work because the inspiration might spark an idea of something but you will never get past that first initial idea and, and maybe like to have a thought of, okay, this film, yeah, this is the film, this is what I wanna make. You will never get past that if you think about it in like, inspiration, if that is you know, what it is. Uh, inspiration can, of course, like, you can be inspired and feel like, okay, so I wanna create something, but the thing that's going to get you to create is just like sitting down and working and starting that whole process. And then you will, you know, find a new thing that inspires you to get to the next stage and next stage and next stage. So it's all about kind of going into that rabbit hole and, and getting small fragments that take you a little bit further, further down that ID that eventually shapes into a story of some sort. That's at least how it works for me. Uh, yeah. Th thousand dollars for all you need. Camera, basic lens option, yeah. Then you will keep it simple. I will make a video on that, promise. Uh, I hate <laughs> Marcus. I hate travel videos, but I love music videos. In my world, music videos can be an art form. Chris Cunningham, yeah. I mean, if in that sense, yes. And I have a friend that made a music video uh, that was amazing. But I rarely watch music videos. Sometimes I do, but I always feel like it's repetitive after the first minute. And if you are the type of uh, music video director that does like Kendrick Lamar or something like that, yeah, sure, then it can be fantastic. But still, it's never a short film. It's never as impactful as that. It's still, you know, a lot of repetition in terms of images. At least my opinion, but I love Michel Gondry and Chris Cunningham. Um, but I think that era of music videos is gone, though. 
Can you film a documentary alone? Yes, I do it all the time. That's all I do. Every day, bro. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. So let me see. I had a different question in the community tab. Let me get it. Where you at? Too slow. There we go. Okay, so. Uh, can help with how to get to keep the focus on spot using manual focus in video i miss my focus a lot of time during my running gun shoots please provide some tips uh, and nailing in focus all the time using a small t-stop or shallow depth of field uh, i mean there is a big misconception in terms of uh, nailing focus so if you look at a professional production you always have a focus puller so trying to do the same thing as a focus puller does uh, going and having it tack sharp all the time. That's not going to happen. That's why you have a focus puller. It's just not going to happen. It's impossible. And I'm really, really good at nailing focus manually. And I can't do it. And I think that the thing is that if you look at, uh, for instance, a Super uh, 35 sensor, like the C300, you should probably... Sure, looking at the small screen, it looks like, oh, it's so sharp. Like everything looks really sharp. This, for instance, is at 2.8. And this is probably, it could probably be 3.5, you know, without any issue. 4.0, probably, without any issue of like it looking not cinematic or whatever it is that, that you look for. So I think that there is a big misconception that you have to be, for instance, on 1.8 or 1.4 or whatever you have, like the lower f-stops. What happens at those is also that you get blurred, uh, all like all this gets blurred, uh, and not the background. I'm talking about like the circular shape here. Uh, all those things get blurred, and sometimes that's a style that can be good if you get close to a person i think that that is not a very good way of working because you have so much uh, like the, when people move and you're for instance this far away when people move just like millimeters you're gonna get uh, out of focus and that's an issue that uh, you know people don't that are professional they don't try that even they know that sticking to for instance 2.8 or 4.0 a lot of people shoot at 5.8 uh, or 5.6 i mean and that has to do with that having people in focus having more people for instance you have one person sitting here and they're a little bit behind or one person here and having both in focus like working with high dynamic range cameras is what i like to do so i'm not very fond of that shallow depth of field but uh, zero silence was shot on a 5d mark ii it was really shallow depth of field so if you want to see how like that whole film is made and, and that go watch that one because it has that shallow depth of field through the whole film and i mean that was fine then i think but i don't think that you have to do that now because there is dynamic range in in all the cameras there's not a camera that doesn't have like sufficient dynamic range as long as you expose right and don't try to push it too much in the post so try to work with higher apertures and sure if you want to show shoot in low light maybe you have to go down but don't think that like you have to shoot on the lowers, uh, lower lower um, f-stops just to get a good picture that's just not true and it looks like for instance okay so everything is sharp when you look at it maybe on a small screen but when you get a bigger screen you're gonna get too much blur if you look in a cinema and you have 1.8, if it's not an effect that you're going for, then that's gonna be really distracting in the long run. 
And if you look at, uh, I've recommended a film before that's called uh, Fire at Sea. It was shot on the, I think, uh, Alexa Mini and two primes. Two, uh, I guess, Ari primes? No? Maybe it was the, no, let me think. It was probably the, which one was it? Was it the size? I think it was two size cinema lenses. Uh, around I think 20 and 28 or something like that, 35 or 24, that type of uh, thing. And all of that was shot around I think 3.5 and above-ish. And that has to do with when you blow it up on a big screen, it's not going to look the same. But if you do YouTube videos, I, then I can understand why you want to have the shallow depth of field because it does give a different type of look to a small screen. So then it, it does make sense. But I don't think that anybody striving to do something cinematic should stare at themselves blind on the f-stops like that. Yeah, if it's just a tool to get a exposure and get you know things bright enough, then you should probably also look at lighting things and trying to get the aim ambient light in a room up, yeah, because that can be done you know if, for anybody in any situation. You can get the ambient light up. It doesn't have to be that you light the scene. Maybe you don't have that time when you do docs, but you still can get the ambience up. And I think that you can be a little bit more deliberate when, with scenes and stuff, so you can light, because that's really what kind of takes uh, your craft to the next level when you start to work with the whole like aspect of filmmaking, not just run and gun type of thing. Um, but when you do run and gun and you want to have that focus, yeah, don't be afraid to not be on 1.4 or whatever, because for a certain situation you shouldn't be. If you are moving around, I don't think you should be. If you are shooting several people, you shouldn't be that uh, low, just because you won't get people to focus. But then if you shoot it for a style uh, that's supposed to be like claustrophobic type of feel, then it makes sense. But think about that and yeah. Not staring yourself blind at that. Should we use Magic Lantern in our camera? Yes, you should. I love Magic Lantern. I used it for a long ass time. It's uh, really good, but it does take time to convert stuff, which some people will hate, but uh, it makes sense because you get so much out of the camera. And uh, yeah, uh, like all the stuff that you get in camera to kind of control the image and all that, it's worthwhile. But also the quality, of course, but that you know. It's not risky at all, I think. I've used it for many years and I think it's never crashed. You just take the battery out and it resets. So it's never been any issue at all. Uh, but yeah, things can always happen. Don't sue me when it happens. <laughs> Okay, so last question. Hey, I love you stuff. Thanks for the content. Can you give some pro tips preparing good questions for interviews? Okay, so questions for interviews is, is kind of a, an interesting thing because you can have so much uh, like different stuff that you actually um, prepare for. So if you're in a situation where you're doing an interview, I think that the the most important thing is to listen and go where the conversation or interview goes and be quiet and wait for things to happen. I think that's more important than having the right questions. Because if you just have like a conversation with somebody and you sit and you listen and you, and you like wait for things to happen, like wait when somebody answers and they stop and they're quiet, wait like five seconds or maybe even more for them to start talking again because that awkwardness is what brings out a new response or something new for them to say. You need to feel those things. That I think is really valuable to, to kind of work uh, around. So don't stare yourself too blind on uh, the questions. But then in terms of questions, let me see, I just sent some questions for Andre who's doing uh, a casting interview. Let me see what I sent to him. <coughs> Okay, so for instance, he's doing a casting interview. So this is just like general trying to get a character forward. Uh, and it's about like a mining thing and, and uh, a city that's 
um, yeah, an old mining city. So then the questions that I want to ask is more about like, what does he love with the place that he lives in? Um, how does he wish that that place would be? Because it's not what he wishes it to be. I know that for a fact. So I'm asking, what does he wish for it to be? Um, and what had he done with the city if you know he had uh, all the money in the world? What, what would he change about the place that he lives in? Um, what does he see like the city being in the future, for instance? Um, and um, or what what does the future look like for that city? That sort of question. Uh, and then like how would he describe that place? Those types of questions, they usually get you like to a deeper type of answer. Um, but then that's more of like the place. And then if we look at like more personal stuff, like I'm always interested in the whole life situation. So I look a lot towards like, is he single? Is he married? All those things you need to figure out. Uh, and then like you get to, for instance, what does he dream about? What's important for him? All those things you want to know. And if it's like somebody that's going to change something then or want something to change, then maybe you should ask, you know, what he wants to do uh, in the next five years. What does he want to do? Um, and what's like, what's the, his biggest challenge in life? What does he struggle with, you know? Um, and what makes you happy is another one. Um, Uh, 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 uh. What's his biggest passion? Can you describe those? Mm, does he have any favorite places in the city that he lives in? Can you describe them and, and why are they favorite places? Always ask why all the time. Try to just listen in on the answers and then like follow up. Yeah, I guess that's some uh, questions that you can work with. Um, yeah. Okay, so thank you guys for tuning in next week. See you. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna actually try my other SIM card and see if it's, it's even better. Because now that I shut everything off, it seems to work. But damn it, why does it take my bandwidth? So anybody knows which is the lab, which is uh, the Sennheiser 416. Let me know in the comment section. Bye bye.